Hey, what is going on, everybody, and welcome to the College Info Geek Podcast. My name is Thomas Frank, and my friend Martin has broken everything. We're supposed to be Have internet I? superheroes, Martin. Yeah? Internet superheroes oh, no. who know everything, give all the rich tips, and are just... Yeah, come on. I ruined it. You ruined it. I'm the worst. You blew it. Martin woke up with a cold this morning. It was an accident. Which lifestyle entrepreneurs who work independently of any location and run thriving online businesses selling products and giving out the most insanely useful and actionable advice hashtag ball and hashtag crush it never get sick That's come true. on man I, I know i probably should have like <laughs> read a blog post on how not to get a cold yeah but i failed to read a blog post i can look it up right now how not to get a cold okay First, top of Google here. We got a picture of Kanye with shades just saying, um, don't be a wimp and deal with it with that lots of hashtags. That's not what is on your screen. That's not even what is on your screen. <laughs> I'm looking at it right now. WebMD <laughs> diagnosis. Uh, you're being a wimp yeah. and prognosis, deal with it. But my doctor says is that prognosis all the, time. the right way. <laughs> it doesn't feel good. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's what that'll be 75 bucks, please. Yeah, you're just, you're just <laughs> that's being your a copay. Wimp. I'm actually going to charge you extra because I'm tired of listening to this. Mm, it's time for a cringy segue. Oh, no. Getting told that by your doctor might stress you out. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that is what we're talking about today. I wanted to do an episode on stress because as it turns out, stress is an important thing to know about. Stress can be good and stress can be bad. So today... We, we tried to outline this episode once and we got six pages of literally like tons and tons of research. I don't even know how exactly we're going to sift through it all. Um, but this morning I gave it the old college try and we've boiled it down to an outline. So today, guys, we are going to break down basically what stress is, kind of compare the good and the bad aspects of stress, define what kind of stress is good and what kind of stress is bad. And also we've got 10 tips for dealing with bad stress, plus one bonus tip. Oh man, it's a bonus. Listen all the way till the end. Exclusive. You can't have the bonus. <laughs> Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And friend us on Friendster. Send us fan even, mail. Is that even a real thing? Is that a real website? I don't know. It used to be. I'm not part of the internet. I think Friendster was like before MySpace. Well, I did not get into the game before MySpace. So. You you are obviously too new to the game, man. Yeah, I had a game. Zanga, and I was on the Demon Hunter forums when I was 13 years old. That is the edgiest thing I've ever heard. It of. was really edgy. I don't even know what that means. Demon Hunter is a, a metal band. Unless like you were a legitimate demon hunter. Oh, well, I was that too. That's cool. Yeah. You know, I have my team with our, our what's it, what's called paranormal uh, sensory equipment. Yeah. And we go into abandoned buildings with headlamps on. Yeah, this is Grave Encounters. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. a good movie, by the way. Yo, man, can you can you just can you look at the camera and tell us that you saw a ghost here? We'll give you twenty bucks. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was a really scary. <laughs> yeah, it's a great movie. <laughs> yeah, no, I actually was. I was a member of the Demon Hunter forums back when I was thirteen years old. It was the first metal band I ever listened to, and um, I, I probably told you this story before. That's how I learned web development. It was kind of my initiation because there was all the cool people on the forum who liked this other band and I couldn't find their music because I didn't know about all the illegitimate methods of downloading music when I was 13 and uh, the nearest CD store was very far away. So I just figured this band is cool. I'll make a website for them. Oh yeah. yeah you like <laughs> hadn't even listened to them or something. Yep. You just made a bunch of, you made a website with a bunch of pictures of a band that you didn't even listen to. Yeah. And it was the best. It was legitimately the best one on the internet at the time. That is because I, I found weird. all the other websites on the Internet and I basically took everything from all of them and made the most comprehensive resource for the band Zao you know, that actually, ever existed. This, this and had never well listened with to them. stuff like what Pat Flynn talks about, like if you want to build a niche website, you don't actually have to care about the topic or really know what you're doing. You just <laughs> need to be comprehensive and find all the yes. right stuff. Yeah. Yeah, Pat Flynn's niche site advice. Is it niche or niche? I never know. I always I think they're it niche. Niche. I'm going to go with niche then. Oh, okay. Just because, you know, screw you, man. It's like being a journalist, but then making money from your journalism. So like being a journalist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's, that's kind of what it is. You're yeah, just making like a big resource like for something that you're not necessarily into that much. That is an interesting point. 
It's just identifying a market and, and going out and learning everything you want to know about it. Anywho. Cool. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I wanted to start and stuff. I wanted to start this episode with a story because uh, I think it would be boring just to flat out define what stress is. Now, we have a couple PowerPoint slides. We're just going <laughs> to read the PowerPoints to you. So, so fourth grade, there, there came a time in fourth grade where I had to learn long division. And up until this point, school had been really easy. I had was I was homeschooled for first and second grade and half a third grade. Everything was pretty easy then. And then I did public school for the last half of third grade. All the math I learned, basically everything was easy for me at the time. I get to fourth grade and we get to long division and I just didn't get it. So one of my most clear and stand out ish memories from fourth grade is me just in class crying my eyes out because I did not understand long division. And I now understand that this was caused by stress. You really took that long division to heart. (laughs) I did because what stress is, is basically kind of like a boiled down definition is stress is really just the body's reaction and the brain's reaction to any sort of threat in the environment. And for me, that threat wasn't so much that I didn't understand long division, but it was that my entire perception of school being easy and me being smart was kind of shattered in that moment. And I didn't know how to deal with it. And that's kind of what happens when you don't know how to deal with a situation properly. Stress can really take over and have some pretty bad effects like you crying in class and looking like a total baby when you're already 11 years old and you need to knock that nonsense out. Actually, wait, 11 years old isn't fourth grade, nine years old. Wow. Still old enough not to be crying over math, though sometimes even as a senior in high school, I wanted to do that. Some really hard math. It could be. You know what? I take that back. Math is worth crying over at any age there. At any age, there is a math problem out there that will bring a grown man to tears. Yeah. yeah there's, <laughs> there's this one math problem that can make any man cry and you'll never guess what it is. <laughs> it's it's probably like the math equation for figuring out how much his wedding costs. Yeah. Or how much your, yeah, your student there's debt like a, is. There's a dad joke in here somewhere. Yep. But we're not dads yet. We'll come back. We'll loop around to this point when and if we become dads and yeah, we'll get make a joke. much better and also worse at the same time joke. Cool. It's a good plan. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about what exactly stress is. We've, we've talked about it's basically a reaction to a threat in our environment. Yeah. And the problem is we live in a world where there's usually asterisk on that, usually not a tiger jumping out and trying to eat you. Or a, like angry mob of fire ants chasing you like that Indiana Jones movie. Yeah. So logically, the stress response isn't super useful anymore. But unfortunately, our bodies can't really tell a difference between a tiger attack and a fire ant stampede and your boss being vaguely disappointed at you or you being late to work or something or, or a traffic jam. Yeah, well, we haven't really like our perspective is such that I've never felt the stress of a tiger trying to attack me. So some of the most stressful things I've ever felt. I could probably line that up. Aren't even close. Maybe if I got attacked by tigers, the normal everyday stuff wouldn't stress me out anymore. There's our first. have a good comparison. Yeah. So our first big tip is you need some perspective. Go get chased by tigers. Yeah. (laughs) I could probably, uh, you know, I could probably lock that down for you. We get a plane ticket to where are tigers. This is a good use of money. Wherever the jungles are. Yeah. We'll just go wander around in there. That's a business expense. We are inoculating our brains against stress by exposing ourselves to wild tigers. If we live through it, we'll be able to handle anything. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. I I could probably sell some sort of weird business entrepreneur event. It's like a stress vaccination. Mm -hmm. This is an entrepreneur retreat slash getaway slash safari slash run for your life. Most dangerous game type scenario. Only $3,000 plus you fund your own travel. That sounds good. But you're going to take so many rich tips away from it. Yeah. (laughs) You're going to get so many networking connections. All right. Well, stress isn't always bad, though. It's not always a tiger. Yeah. So that's the thing. Stressors can be anything. And your body kind of has the same reaction to all of them. But the big thing to realize here is that stress is good in the short term. And it kind of sharpens our senses and hones our focus and lets us improve. For example, did you know that broccoli is toxic? Uh, no. Yeah. So if an insect eats broccoli 
and I'm sure there are some insects out there that won't die, but most insects that eat broccoli die because broccoli is toxic, but our bodies are strong enough to handle those toxins. And in fact, that is part, not the only, the only reason, but part of the reason that broccoli is healthy for us because our bodies are adapted to respond to stress and it damages us a little bit, but we come back stronger. It's yeah, why like vaccines Saiyans. work. You know, we're like, what? We're like Saiyans. We are like Saiyans. Yeah. Yeah. Or like Hydras or something. I don't know. But yeah, well, you beat us down, we come back stronger as long as you don't beat us down too hard. Yeah. What happens, what really causes the problem though and why so many people believe that stress is bad and why stress can be bad is when stress is long-term and when it just keeps happening all in, all like all day, day in, day out, all the time. And that's defined as chronic stress. And that is really what starts to harm people. But I wanted to kind of get in front of all the bad parts we're going to talk about because I was doing some reading while we were researching for this episode and there was a study and I think I can link to it in the show notes, but I don't have it in the notes here about how people's perceptions about stress actually affect how it, how it damages or benefits them. So if you view stress as something that is good, as something that will make you a better person through the challenges it brings, then you will react better to stress in real life. And if you view stress as a bad thing, as just something that will hurt you, then you are more likely to have bad outcomes to stressors. So like if you view stress as more of a challenge as opposed to a threat, mm -hmm. it will actually play out that way. Yeah, exactly. Well, like, yeah, not, like, like, not like, always. Well, not always, but, but for the most part, it's like a placebo kind of thing. Mm -hmm. the your way, attitude the definitely you perceive it changes how it, it affects you. Right. Yeah. Your attitude will determine at least somewhat how your body and your mind actually responds to stress. I wanted to get a little nerdy here first before we get into how to kind of shape your attitude a bit and some other tips and talk a, a little bit about the biology of stress, because I think this stuff is interesting. So I don't know if you're not a biology nerd, then too bad because I'm going to get into it here. So basically, when a stressor comes into, you know, into your life, your what's it called? Your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which you can just call the HPA axis, gets I activated. I call it that all the time. And it's basically this path between your hypothalamus and your pituitary gland and your adrenal glands gets activated and it releases several different things. It releases like epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, but it also releases a chemical called cortisol. And this is the big one here. So in the short term, cortisol will help tense your muscles up along with adrenaline. It will... Uh, narrow your vision of your focus and your your vision will get a little bit better. Um, you'll be on high alert. And like if you get cut or something, you're less likely to bleed. Your blood will coagulate better. Your base, your body goes into overdrive pretty much. And you have what's called the fight or flight response. And in a short term, this is fine because it allows you to run away from a tiger or fight the tiger if you're really cool. But over the long term, cortisol has some bad effects. It can wreak havoc on your gut, which can cause heartburn. It can cause weight gain. It can mess with your appetite. It can suppress like the feeling that you're full and it can increase the feeling that you're hungry and the feeling that you really want to eat bad kinds of food. It will actually decrease the size of your hippocampus, which is the part of your brain that deals with learning and memory and the neurogenesis, the, the birth of new nerve cells in the hippocampus can decrease because of constant cortisol presence. And you actually, this is the kicker here, you get weaker HPA axis control when there's too much cortisol pumping through your system over the long term. So it can become a vicious cycle where because you have less control over your HPA axis, more stressors come in, you have a worse reaction, you're less able to deal with those stressors and more cortisol, horrible downward spiral. That's now, not good. Now, you said the, the hippocampus actually shrinks. Do you know if that's, is that like permanent? Can you recover from that? You can you, recover from if it. If you stop going under chronic stress? Yes, you can. And that's a good thing. So that's, that's good. A few more bad things before we get into that, because uh, I wanted to go through the notes here. Oh, there's so your more bad. prefrontal cortex, that frontal part of your brain that is involved in social situations, learning and memory, short-term memory, all your judgment that, uh, you know, the, the thing that gets affected when you drink alcohol that can shrink too, due to stress. So I've seen headlines somewhere where people have wrote, 
oh, stress driving is the same thing as drunk driving. That's not true at all. But that's kind of what they're drawing from, where your prefrontal cortex's ability to control your judgment and do other things can be weakened. And then your blood vessel linings can also be weakened, which can contribute to your risk of heart attack and stroke increasing. And it also clamps down your immune system, so you're more likely to get sick. So if you let chronic stress keep happening, a lot of really bad things can happen in your life, which will just exacerbate that stress. But luckily, like you mentioned, chronic stress can be reversed. A lot of these things can be reversed. The hippocampus can be, you know, can grow back. Neurogenesis can happen. And there are a lot of things you can do to help this happen. One of the most important ones is exercise. Uh, And I talked to Dr. John Rady back in episode 105 about how exercise affects the brain. He has an entire chapter about stress in his book where there's all this research presented about how stress is basically dampened through exercise. So if you feel stressed, go outside and go for a run or go do something that you think is fun. That's kind of ironic since like exercising is putting small amounts of stress onto all of your muscles and your lungs and such. But it's, but it's like, it's not, it's it's not really ironic because it is putting stress on certain parts of the body, but it's also providing an outlet for that stress. That's one of the big problems when you're inactive, your fight or flight response gets all revved up and your cortisol gets, you know, your your system's flooded with cortisol and adrenaline, all these things, but it's like your engine's revving. There's nowhere for it to go. your, Your body's like, Hey, Hey, I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's do something. Let's do something. And then you just don't do anything. And then you just don't. Yeah. So that that's sense. that's a kind of a crash course on the biology. And we'll definitely link to some videos and some articles in the show notes. Specifically, there are two TED Ed videos. There's one on how stress affects the mind and one on how stress affects the body, which had some of the weirdest animation I've ever seen. It was pretty cool. It was cool, though. Yeah, it was, it was cool animation, but it was very... It was very weird. The The mind one was more normal animation, but they're both very good videos. And um, there's also a video on my channel that my friend Jess did. And it was our first collab and she talked a bit about stress. So we'll have those linked up in the show notes. But hopefully that gives you kind of a bit of a crash course. Also, that stress chapter in the book Spark, fantastic overview about how the whole system works is just awesome. And we, we were sitting there with like 11 different books <laughs> trying to write notes about how stress works. Yeah. Because we didn't want it to just be a biology lesson. We wanted to get into some actionable ways that you can deal with your stress and reduce it and also use it better. Before we get into that, though, I know you wrote some things down about eustress versus distress. So what exactly are the differences here? Yeah, so the idea is that stress isn't always bad for you. And so eustress is essentially good stress mm. and distress is bad stress. Basically, from the way that I'm looking at it, eustress in too large of an amount or for too long will become distress. Mm, Okay. So you want to keep your stress in small amounts that are useful, but you stress, the good stress is good for you because it helps you feel more alive in a lot of situations. For example, if you go skydiving or you like roller coasters, your body's undergoing a little bit of stress, but it's exhilarating. You, you feel excited. If you want to go ask out a pretty human somewhere, and you're really nervous about it, but you do it. And afterwards, you're like, yes, I did it. That's be- You're excited because you just did something stressful mm-hmm. and it made you feel a little more alive. But if you keep doing these stressful things too much, it's like the it's chronic stress. Eventually, your body can't recover. And after things like this, it's usually a good idea to retreat to some sort of comfort zone to to reboot so that you can go out and handle stress again. Okay. So in the reading you did, was there any kind of discussion over types of stress that might immediately be distress? Is there any level of stress that's just straight out bad? Well, I would imagine there are quite a few activities that are immediately a higher amount of stress. Like Mm -hmm. being attacked by a tiger is never going to come in such a small amount of stress that it's you stress unless you're used to fighting tigers. I remember reading about PTSD and how some of the first recorded cases of it were happening after world war one um dan carlin's podcast hardcore history has a really good discussion about this effects uh people were being literally shot as deserters because they were going crazy from being stuck in trenches for weeks on end in the worst possible conditions you can imagine i think he mentioned something along the lines of ptsd not really being as big of a problem in wars 
before World War I because the engagements were so short, relatively. It might be a day on the battlefield, especially when you get into ancient combat. So it makes me wonder if the human body is really just programmed and able to withstand a huge amount of stress if it's very short term. Hmm. I wonder I wonder if there's something that could be so stressful. I, I would imagine something like truly traumatizing. Well, yeah, could be really harmful, but. And each person has their own level of stress they're ready for. So a soldier, a yeah. soldier has been training in stressful situations. Mm-hmm. Any Navy SEAL right now is going to respond way better than I will to tons of things. Yeah. And then come back after it after a day and be fine. Whereas I might be like, I'm going to take a few days off. I don't I don't know what to think right now. Yeah, I guess if you get thrown into a war zone because I've never no experienced prep. that level of stress yet, mm-hmm. whereas they're a little more familiar with it. But, okay, but humans are definitely very adaptable to that. It's interesting that that wasn't a problem until World War One, at least documented. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I don't want to go out and say like that there was no PTSD before World War One, but yeah, the conditions of that war were so different because you have a situation where generals and military leaders are using old school tactics that worked for technology that was completely superseded by the time that war came around. You know, in the 1800s, you don't have crazy long range artillery like you do in World War I. You don't have tanks. You don't have, you know, machine gun nests and stuff. You're dealing with a totally different kind of warfare. And this is right around the time where kind of all the countries at least all the the quote unquote first world countries were getting that kind of stuff, but they didn't know how to use it. So their tactics were, you know, create a big line and we're going to sit in a trench and we're going to throw people into a meat grinder, basically. So it became an issue where people were just literally mentally snapping because they couldn't deal with it. Yeah, well, from that description there, especially that meat grinder bit, that seems reasonable. Yeah, sounds sounds pretty reasonable. But luckily, as a student, you probably won't have to be going through it. Yeah, all right. So it turns out there artillery are artillery ways that you can uh, deal with stress. Let's talk about <laughs> dealing with stress because now this is a little stressful now talking about that. It is getting stressful. It's a very, if you can, yeah, if you can deal with those kind of discussions, it's a very good podcast series. Although it's, it's like four hour episodes and there are five of them. That dude does not mess around with his, with his podcast episodes. Wow. Which is why they come out once every six months, it seems. Wait for the next one, Dan. Come on. But like I said earlier, we have 10 tips for dealing with bad stress, plus a bonus one. It's not it's not that big of a bonus. Yeah, it's a you, very specific. You really sold them. You really <laughs> sold them on that one. <laughs> we can't be too clickbaity, or is it download baity for podcasts? I don't know. It's a, they kind of click on it. I mean, you have to click on it to download it mm-hmm. or tap it. So the first one that I want to talk about was something that I've been thinking about for a long time, kind of trying to build a way of explaining it in my mind and I've called it my stress management algorithm and this is basically just like a series of mental steps that I go through when I have something stressing me out and I've always felt that if you have a system in place for processing things then everything just ends up working out better like we talked about in the last episode I have systems in place for dealing with my laundry so it never ends up in a pile on my floor or dealing with the mail, so it never ends up piled up my desk. Well, I've tried to kind of create like a mental scaffolding or a flow chart of sorts for dealing with stress. So basically when there's something that's stressing me, I try to first define it. I ask myself, what exactly is stressing me out? Can I identify the element of whatever I'm thinking about that's really bringing on some stress? And from there, The next step is to think about, okay, what elements of this stressor can I actually control? So if politics are stressing me out, I can easily start to think, okay, there's really not a whole lot I can control here. My circle of influence is kind of limited to education and student issues. I can send out some angry tweets or something, but there's really not much I can do to affect the situation at large right now. But if it is something small, like, oh, I really need to go pay the rent, I have a ton of control over that. I can easily create a task and do it. So define what I can control and then ask myself, okay, for the elements that I can control, do I need to wait or is there something I can do right now? So for example, we 
really want to move to Denver. We've talked about this a few times in the podcast. But due to circumstances with the lease and with roommates and being a nice person, we can't leave till April, which is what, nine months from now? A baby baby. from now? It's a baby. (laughs) A celebrity baby from now. So that is something that I technically have control over. I can I can sign a lease for an apartment. I can pack my stuff. I can move. There are things and steps that I will go through, but I cannot do them until April. So those have to be put off. But for things I can control, then we get into productivity territory. We're establishing a plan. We are inputting tasks into a task management system, and then we're actually doing it. And then uh, for the things I can't control, either ever or just not right now, the things I need to wait on, I decide how to mentally deal with them. So can I kind of file them away mentally? Um, Can I kind of process them and and like kind of grok them, identify all their features and really just well, like define them and crystallize them in my head so that they no longer just define stress? Because I think uh, part of stress is really just caused by uncertainty and not really being able to define what your enemy is or, or understand something clearly. Can I talk to somebody about it? Because as easy as it is for me to tell myself that I can deal with all stressors, I do know through experience that not talking about it eventually becomes a problem. And talking about it, by contrast, can really help because other people can at least empathize if not come up with better solutions that I may not have seen. And then do I need to go do something to deal with the stress? Something simple like exercise or meditation or I don't know, anything else. So that's kind of my little algorithm of sorts. I don't know if you deal with stress in a similar way, but that's kind of how I think of it. It's very flowcharty. Yeah, I try to just focus on what I can handle now. It's basically mm-hmm. the same thing. I just don't flowchart it in my brain. Okay. I don't my brain is for it. My my brain, no. Not David. David Blaine is not in my brain. My brain is very flowcharty. So that's definitely how I do it. Now, I had a second tip and this is very related because I think it is something you should do while going through whatever version of stress management algorithm you have, and that's to write out your anxieties. And this has some science behind it because there was a study done at uh, at the University of Chicago, that's what it was, where they had students write out their test anxieties on a scrap of paper before they started a test, and the ones that did got better grades. And I talked about that, that tip in a video that I made on test anxiety over a year ago now, And only just recently did I make the connection, which was like an oh duh kind of connection, that that doesn't only work for test anxiety. It works for any kind of anxiety. Yeah. Just write down what's bugging you. And I mean, I did this with you in the room last week where I wrote down, I think it was like seven different things that I was stressed about. And, you know, I was stressed about, okay, sales for the business are lower in July. So like, What's going on right now, which is stressful because now I'm paying you I'm paying Anna expenses are higher for services I'm paying for. So income being a little lower is a little bit stressful. And I was also just feeling overworked and I was feeling overwhelmed. Like there was just too much stuff and it was all out of control. I was a little bit stressed about figure skating because I bought these new skates. My coach has been uh, encouraging me to get and they really hurt my feet a lot and they cost a ton of money and can't be returned because they're basically custom fitted. So I was starting to feel like, did I, you know, get totally screwed on these new skates and writing it all down basically helps me go through the algorithm much more easily. And you being in the room actually helped because the moment you saw low July sales, your immediate reaction was, okay, why is that happening? And you kind of helped me figure out, all right, let's look at analytics. It looks like most students aren't thinking too much about school in July. Your traffic is lower in July. Many businesses have low sales in July. Yeah, and writing it down like that, it's easier to look at them one at a time and be like, write a little dash next to it, possible reasons, Mm -hmm. things I can do. Yeah, and you were really helpful because not only that, you were also coming up with ways that we could potentially bring those back up, improve parts of the process that get people to areas of the site where they buy things, etc. That was very helpful. Yeah, whereas if you just let those things jumble around in your mind all at once, it maybe, maybe it would have been harder to focus on any one long enough Mm -hmm. to even think about it productively yeah and then for the the one where i was feeling overwhelmed and and overworked i still feel like that a little bit just because we got a lot of stuff going on we do yeah it's i mean it's august 2nd as we're recording this back to school is coming up and i have always been 
horrendously bad at really taking advantage of the back to school period. It always kind of sneaks up at me and then I go, oh yeah, I should probably do a dorm buying guide or some sort of back to school thing, laptop buying post. And uh, I think I got ahead of it slightly better this year, but not quite better enough. Yeah. <laughs> it was like end of July. There's always next year. There's always next year. That's true. I'm never good at timing as you probably could tell from the how to have a productive summer video that we posted near the end of summer. But uh, hey, it's always there next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but what I did for that one is I wrote down a big list of all the big projects going on because you've always got things going on like in your task management system. For us, it's Asana, all the little tasks. But it's nice to have just a big centralized listing of all the big things going on so you can kind of keep them just straight in your mind. And then the other thing I did was I realized that due to travel and due to feeling like I had too much work to do, I had let my routine slip. My morning routine, my night routine, uh, my skating routine, even the gym routine, those had all kind of slipped. And as much as I want to lie to myself and tell myself that I'm using that time I'm not spending in the gym on work, I'm probably not. I'm probably just using it inefficiently. So those are getting reset up, restructured. My whole routine is getting put back into place. And I think that's just going to keep me overall less stressed and more productive. And then for the skates, that ended up being easy. After writing it down, it didn't seem so bad. I talked to my coach. I said, hey, these hurt quite a lot. And she had me send them over the weekend back with another coach who put them on a stretcher. And the very next time I had them on, they hurt a little bit, but after about half an hour, they were fine. So they still hurt a bit each time that I skate, but I think it's improving just a little bit every single time. And it's to the point where I can now do an hour of practice without having to sit down. So it's all kind of going away. And I was able to kind of process a lot of that stuff. So moving on to the next tip here, I know when we were doing the research for this episode, one of the biggest things that you focused on was being present minded. Yeah. Which just reminded me of all those emails you get from Leo Babata every day that basically say the same thing to be present minded. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, it's it's pretty important. Is it? Okay. It's pretty important. It's one of the biggest themes of things that I've been reading about and thinking about for the last year or two, Like, especially going through the injury that I had to my arms, you know, because obviously that was a lot of chronic stress, mm. tons of chronic stress. That's what a repetitive stress injury is. Yeah. So... Naturally, I needed to find a lot of things to help me recover from that, both mentally and physically. And I've been not as bad as what you have right now, but I've been in a situation where I had a repetitive stress injury in my hands early on in college, actually. And I was constantly anxious about it because I was feeling like, am I going to be able to work? Yeah, I know. For right? the it's, rest of my life. It's terrifying. You like extrapolate it to the future and you just you'll hyper extrapolate that pattern and you're like, I'm ruined. Yeah. Even though you're not necessarily. And that's what makes you go read ergonomics articles for two hours. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, yeah, it really can be something where you're just constantly fixated on what's going to happen in the future. So I could see how being present minded would help, but how do you do it? All right. Well, first I want to talk a little bit about what I've been reading. This book I checked out from a library. Yeah. You can still do that in 2016. It's got paper books in it, and you check them out with a card. But I checked out the Mayo Clinic Guide to Stress-Free Living by Dr. Amit Sood. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I have no idea. And one of the most interesting things I found was in the beginning, they're talking about how they view kind of the way people think. And they're, they're saying there's a default mode and a focused mode. That's how they're looking at it. And so the default mode is kind of like... It's internally directed, but you're not focused on anything. You're just jumping from thought to thought to worry. You're simulating arguments and hypothetical scenarios. You're just kind of scatterbrained. Mm. You know, this is what basically happens if you read a page of a book and you notice when you get to the bottom, you have no idea what you just read because you started halfway through thinking about what you have to do later, how much laundry you have. Yeah. And you get confused. Like that's the default mode they're talking about. And then they're talking about focused mode, which is almost like that state of flow that people talk about. Basically, you're very present-minded on the activity you're doing to the point that you can end up being forgetful of yourself and your worries. Like mm. uh, a good example is when I'm out taking pictures. I was out at like dawn taking pictures for my photography class 
Well, it was around dawn because it, I was out there for like two hours, but it felt like five minutes. I had no idea how much time had passed because yeah. I completely forgot myself while I was doing it. And this focused mode that they talk about, one of the things that they mentioned was that it's a lot easier to attain and maintain when it's externally directed onto an activity. Okay. As opposed to meditation, which is internally directed focused mode. But they say that the external mode is a lot easier for most people. So they have a program where they help people get rid of stress. And their first step is to try something external before meditating. So like mm. exercising, exercising, reading, and even something like cleaning. But the adult coloring book craze that is happening right now, that is also basically an externally directed meditation. Oh, yeah. I hadn't thought about it that way, but that is true. Yeah. yeah the idea is that you're in the activity. And you're forgetting what's going on around you because you're so present in the activity. And this isn't the default mode. And it's kind of hard for people naturally, especially right now. We're in the digital age. We've got tons of stuff distracting us. Mm -hmm. A good quote about this that I like from the book, The Tao of Pooh, one of my favorite books, is in reference to the human mind, they say, it drives down the street in a fast moving car and thinks it's at the store going over a grocery list. Like we're so focused mm. on what we're doing in five <laughs> minutes or what we have to do later or what we did yesterday that we're not present in what we're doing. Yeah. And of course, we're not very good at this naturally, except for in the case of maybe a fight or flight where you're already really stressed. But think about it in nature. There's this picture. There's this very cool picture that my photography teacher told me about where there's this photographer out in the woods and he's got his tripod. And he's taking this picture of like a mother bear and her cubs laying down by the river. And he's being very careful, very aware because he does not want to be eaten by bears, but he wants to get the picture. He doesn't even know. And another photographer caught this on the picture that a male grizzly bear is oh my like gosh. right behind him. It's in the picture. He has no idea because he is so present, present minded that he cannot react to things around him. He's not paying attention. And in nature, it turns out. <laughs> It's not always a good idea to be super present minded about what you're doing. You, yeah. A lot of the a lot of times you need to be paranoid. You need to be scatterbrained thinking what's in that bush? What's in that bush? What's in that bush? Do I have food today? I don't know, but I should probably get some. Like nature doesn't care if you're a little stressed if it prevents you from being eaten by a bear. Well, it's almost like I'm just thinking of rabbits or deer versus a lion. Yeah. You know, like rabbits and deer are constantly twitchy and they're always looking all over the place yeah, they need always, to be scared and if the lion is just, just like room, if you see a deer focused. meditating with its eyes closed it is going to be eaten that deer's dead it's going to happen mm -hmm. so it's a little hard for us naturally to just be super focused and present minded until we get into the fight or flight mode yeah and unfortunately there's a there's a study called a wandering mind is an unhappy mind and it was done by Matthew Killingsworth and Daniel Gilbert, author of Stumbling on Happiness. Okay. And they studied 2,250 adults. And essentially, they found that when those people were focusing on the present, they felt happier. So mm. your default mode, your non-present mode, is ironically going to stress you more. And you can't do much about it other than try to maintain presence. So if you're really stressed externally directing your attention can help you and make you forget your worries for a second. So what are some ways that you can get yourself into this state? Because I know that that flow state, quote unquote, is amazing to be in. The most recent example of it, I kind of get into flow when I make my videos, but not always. I think all of my videos are good, but there are some where the entire time I'm editing I'm thinking, this is hard. I don't want to be doing this. This, you know, I don't want to make this animation. Oh, it's so many clicks, so many keyframes I got to put in. When I was making the video on how to get to bed on time, I woke up on a Saturday morning thinking I would do two extra hours of editing on it. And I ended up editing for eight straight hours on that video. And I did not have any, any perception of time while yeah, I was doing see, that. It's a beautiful thing to Just feel the that. whole day. And uh, the most recent one I did, which was, as of this recording, was the one on flashcards. It was a similar situation, especially when I was doing the drawings with that new overhead shooting rig that, that I built. That was just so cool because I wasn't thinking about anything else except for I'm drawing this thing. It's going to be cool when I make it later in editing. Yeah. 
but it's hard to get there. Yeah, it's definitely I want to be there, but it's hard. So what are some ways that people can get there? And I know we're kind of verging into productivity territory here, but this is also very helpful for dealing with stress. Well, this is kind of similar to what I've been doing to try to up my fiction reading Mm -hmm. lately, because I've had a problem where when I start reading it, I can't quite get immersed into the world immediately. I'm still thinking about what I have to do today and what I have to do tomorrow. So I'm still, I've got one foot in the real world when Mm. in order to be into my fiction, I need to have my mind present into that universe and intake it. Yeah. And my solution to that recently has been simply to force myself to read it for longer. I'm trying to read 50 pages a day right now because for the first like 10 or 15 pages, I'm still half in the real world. Yeah. But after that, eventually, when I get into the thing more and more, I'll start to forget what else is going on. So basically, the same applies to my photography and the same applies to if I want to go outside biking. For the first little bit, I'm still thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. But if I keep trying to focus on that and I don't have like a time limit, I'm not looking at my clock going, do I still have time to ride my bike? I don't know. Looks like I'm almost done. But if I do it for a little bit, then it's more likely if I'm patient that I will get to the point where I forget what else is going on. Not having a time limit is one of the biggest things for me because I don't have to worry about what's coming up next. Yeah. Do you think we just try to fit too much into every day? I think that we absolutely do because we live in the Western Western culture where basically time is money, work is money. Mm-hmm. We value our time in this weird abstract way where we're spending it on things. Yeah. When really the time moves regardless. And, you know, it's not the only way you can think about that. And that's not something I don't want to get into some deep, crazy philosophy right now. But why not throw down? Because that's going to take four million hours probably. (laughs) But I guess the point is that we don't have to value it that way. So if I'm doing one or two things a day and I feel really good about those two things, I end up feeling better at the end of the day than if I did 10 meticulously scheduled things that yeah. all seemed productive on the surface. If I do laundry, clean the kitchen, clean up a little bit of my room and meditate for five minutes, or if I go out and shoot photos for like three hours, I just get completely lost in it, come home and code something amazing for another two hours. I feel better on that day than I do on the previous day where I did short bursts of 90 activities. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what the balance is or how you'd go about achieving it. Because on one hand, we've talked about the importance of constraints. And we talked about the biggest mistake that I made during my junior summer where I gave myself all day every day to only work on College Info Geek and I used the time very inefficiently. Yeah. But on the other hand, I agree when I try to put too much into my day, I'm constantly thinking ahead of the next thing. Even last night, Anna and I went up to Ames and we played Pokemon Go on campus and it was fun. It was really fun, especially when I was almost about to get a Scyther, but I couldn't find it. Oh, man. In the forest. But it's okay because I got a Pidgeot and that's pretty cool. But for a lot of that time playing the game, part of my brain was thinking forward to, oh, man, how much time do I have before I have to go to bed? Because I still really want to go home and play Overwatch. And I also really want to get some work done on this design we're doing. And I really should do some more work on the stress podcast script. And it was just constantly like jumping forward, not allowing me to really be focused on arguably the most important thing, which is hanging out with my girlfriend playing Pokemon. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's really tough to keep those things out of your head because we're so used to juggling so many things in this society. At least we've got a lot of things on our plate Mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily bad, but it does not help our focus at all. There's, There's a quote from that same Mayo Clinic Guide to Stress-Free Living that I really like where they say, the entire week's regrets and what-ifs replay in the mind on weekends. Mondays are lived on Sundays. And this Mm. totally makes sense, especially because I've heard my friends say it. It's Sunday, and they can't enjoy the fact that it's the second day of the weekend because all they're thinking is, I have to work tomorrow. Yeah. Today's ruined because I have to work tomorrow. And they spend the whole day anxious about the next day. They don't even experience the day that they're living at the moment. So maybe if we were to boil down, be present minded into some actions, I suppose it comes down to don't try to shove too much into every single day. Now, 
this is obviously going to be tempered by what your schedule dictates, how much stuff yeah, you have to do. Sometimes you don't have a choice. And I think that maybe once a week, you should have the day where you try to shove all the small little low mental energy maintenance tasks together to get them all done. And hopefully that's going to give you more days during the week where you could be a little bit more airy and stretched out about your time. And maybe you're not trying to schedule things to a T. Maybe you're not saying, you know, this particular task gets three hours. But when you go to bed at night, you know, if you're doing your pre-bed routine and you're writing your next day's plan and you're writing down what you're going to do the next day, you're thinking to yourself, these three things together will probably constitute an entire day of work if I really, truly give them the space they need. Yeah. So you're kind of creating space there. And then I think using something like the Pomodoro technique, just setting a timer or like you said, setting a pretty challenging reading goal. That, those are ways kind of commitment devices or external productivity techniques that can get you into your work because you're creating some sort of criteria you need to meet a time criteria or a page criteria that can help pull you into the work because you know I must do this very concrete quantifiable thing and my concerns about what will happen later in the day won't change that yeah so it's not like I can be late for something I'm like the next thing I have to do is finish these 50 pages mm -hmm. and that's a lot. So I guess I don't have to worry about anything else for a while because it's 50 pages. It's going to be a bit so I can really relax and get into this. Yeah. Now, can you say a little bit about meditation? I know that the yeah. Mayo Clinic guide yeah. said, you know, that's maybe a more advanced well, technique here, but it, I think it's still useful. Oh, it's definitely still useful. They're not saying that it's not good. They're just saying that when it comes to being focused, it is easier for us to focus on something external than internal because when you're internally focused, it's a lot easier to accidentally slip into spontaneous thoughts and worries and mm. ruminations about what's going on in your life. But meditating is obviously really helpful when you can do it. And there are a lot of ways you can meditate. One of the ways that I like is to simply try to be completely present minded and blank, basically focusing on like my breathing or mm -hmm. something, just sitting, focusing on the exact positioning of how my body is and how it's moving as I breathe. Yeah. Just complete blank presentness is really cool for me. But sometimes I meditate on a specific thought or thing I have to do. So I will basically that's like being present minded while thinking or planning about something. So if I'm like, how will I solve this? And I want to meditate on it for 10 minutes. What I'm doing is shutting out every other thought mm. and trying to think only on that. Yeah. And I think there's different kinds of meditation you can do, right? Because yeah. that one's kind of the more Zen focused meditation. But maybe there's kind of an in between because we've talked in the past about how maybe just sitting and listening to an entire album could be considered a form of meditation, though it's still a little external. Yeah, actually, from reading this book, I can now say stuff like that seems like it's externally focused meditation, mm. the same way like one could cook meditatively. I do that. I don't like to cook generally. It's if I think about cooking, it brings about anxiety because I'm it's again, I'm thinking how many more things do I have to do today. Cooking's going to take forever. But there is one night a week where it is my turn to make our tortellini sausage pasta and I just get in the zone when I make that. You know, I get the cutting board out, I cut up the vegetables, I start simmering the meat. The whole process, I know it down to a T. I know all the tools I need. I practice, and I'm going to obviously pronounce this bad again, mise en place. Mise en place, that was actually, that was pretty good. Okay, mise en place, which is French, a French term that kind of means everything in its place, every tool out and put where it should be before you start the work, which is something that many chefs actually practice deliberately. And... That whole process, I don't know why, but cooking that one meal is just, it is a very meditative experience for me and I like doing it. See, and that's interesting because you've mentioned before that some of the more internal meditation is more difficult for you to maintain for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So Extremely this is kind difficult. of a, this is a good example of how being externally focused is, it's easier for us yeah. to shut out other things than being internally focused. It's really easy to go back to your worries. I think you're going to have to discover for yourself what works for you because I love that cooking process and I usually listen to a podcast while I'm doing it. So it's not like I'm, you know, only focusing on the cutting of the vegetables or something, 
but putting on a podcast and listening to that or going to the store, I love to go to the store by myself. Whereas Anna hates going shopping by herself. If she has to go to the store by herself, it's like pulling teeth uh, and she would love to go with me. Honestly, I would rather go by myself because the whole process will have no extra slack time. There's yeah. no waiting for the next person to do something. I can just go in and step by step carry out the task. And that is kind of beautiful to me. I like to fold my own laundry for the same reason. I think tactile kind of physical work can actually be a stress reliever if it's practiced in the way that works for me. Yeah, especially if you're not worried about what's coming next or some sort of time limit. You're just like, I'm doing this until it is done. It's very simple. Yeah, exactly. So the next tip that I want to talk about was something I learned about called screen apnea. Uh, so I, I like bought this sleep book. apnea? Like that? It's like the same. Is sleep it, apnea the condition where you're breathing like where really you stop, shallowly? It's or like where you, you stop breathing? You stop breathing in your sleep, I think. Yes, it's exactly what it is. So we went to this new local bookstore in Ankeny here. It had like a soft opening and I didn't think I was going to buy anything, but I found this little book from 99U, who I think are the same people who run the Behance design portfolio site. And it's called Manage Your Day-to-Day. And it's just a collection of little mini essays written by designers and journalists and writers, people who the people at 99U must like kind of collated together in this little book. And there was an essay called, I believe it was called Get Away From Screens. It was about this condition called screen apnea, and it was written by a writer named Linda Stone. And she observed over 200 people using computers and smartphones. And what she noticed is that the majority were often holding their breath or breathing very shallowly while using their technology. Now, this is a problem because there's basically two different kinds of breathing. There's the regular deep, not really deliberate, but just better type of breathing. And she called it diaphragmatic breathing, just basically deep and regular. And this will quiet your sympathetic nervous system and it amplifies the abilities of the parasympathetic nervous systems, which will govern the feelings of satiety. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but feeling full, healthy organ function, a sense of relaxation, lack of stress. Whereas the shallow breathing and breath holding and also hyperventilation These can all contribute to the sympathetic nervous system getting you into that fight or flight state. So cortisol is flooding your system. And like we said before, when you're sitting around sedentary, looking at your computer, there's no reason for your body to be in this state. All the effects of the stress response are going nowhere and it contributes to chronic stress. So her recommendation was to get away from screens because these, this just constant screen usage is causing people to unconsciously breathe much more shallowly. But what she also noticed is that musicians and dancers, military test pilots, people who had jobs where they were trained to breathe for performance didn't have the same problems. They were trained enough to breathe correctly. So two kind of tips here. Number one, get away from screens, go exercise, go hang out with friends, go do something else. But also consider doing something like a martial art or yoga because these are practices that focus heavily on your breath. Anna and I go do yoga ideally once a week, not always, but ideally. And I was very surprised when I started doing yoga because I thought, oh, it's stretching. We're going to do a lot of stretching. And uh, it is that. But one of the things that our teacher talks about the most is focusing on your breath, making sure to breathe completely doing what she calls yogic breath, where you're filling the diaphragm, you're letting your belly expand, and you're breathing in a specific order. You're trying to suck basically the the gut into your spine when you exhale kind of things. And I always wondered, like, what the heck is the point of this? You know, I'm just breathing. But now that I'm reading this, I think the whole point is to teach you to breathe properly in any situation so you can deal with stress in any situation. Well, that does seem to line up with, like, the general yoga lifestyle, right? Yeah, exactly. So I thought that was a really interesting little stress tip there. Um, The next one that I wanted to talk about was, it's not really an actionable tip, but I wanted to mention that there are many bad outlets for stress and these can become habits. Oh yeah. So a long time ago, back when I first started drinking alcohol, 
I told myself that I will never ever drink if I'm feeling stressed because I do not want my automatic reaction to dealing with a stressful situation to be to think like I need to go have a drink. I need to go relax, you know, grab a beer or something because I don't want to create a habit where the cue is I'm stressed and then the routine becomes go get something alcoholic. I don't want it to become go get something sugary or junk food. A lot of people engage in these bad behaviors as outlets for stress, hooking up with people, all this kind of stuff. And these are outlets that are not going to help solve the problem. They're not really going to, they, they may in some way deal with the short term temporary effects of stress that you're not liking, but in the long run, they don't benefit you. They make you less healthy and they make you less able to deal with future stresses. Yeah. So just kind of a couple things with bad habits and bad behaviors here. Number one, make your bad behavior is bad, quote unquote, be in response to celebratory occasions or to have fun. You yeah, know? on purpose as opposed right. to a reaction to stress. You're like, mm-hmm. I want to do this today. I know, whatever. I know that it's not necessarily the best thing, but it sounds fun and I want to do it. That's yeah. better than saying, I really can't handle life right now. I need to do this. Exactly. Uh, same thing with like something like smoking. A lot of people, stress triggers the desire to smoke. Now, smoking is different because it's truly addictive yeah, so I probably wouldn't I probably wouldn't celebrate. Don't celebrate with, that. with smoking, you know, and there's probably a cigar fishing out out there who's going to be mad at me now. But at least don't celebrate with cigarettes. But, you know, I, I will I will freely admit it that I love whiskey and I love beer. It, it's great, but I only ever drink it if it's just I'm going to have fun. I'm going to sit down and this is because I'm happy and I want to, you know, compliment the occasion with a drink. Yeah. It's never because oh, I've had such a stressful day. I need a drink because that that's a downward spiral. I don't want to get like into. you're enhancing an already good mood, mm-hmm. not recovering from a bad one. Right. And I think so right now I'm doing my 30 day no booze challenge. And um, I think in three days it will be over yeah, you're pretty close. Now, I have noticed I, I always can't remember which podcasts I already talk about this stuff on because I have two podcasts, but I have noticed that I've lost weight and I feel sharper. I feel more creative. So basically experiment successful in that case or in that regard. But I think it was easier to do that experiment because alcohol has never been an outlet for dealing with stress. It's always just been a fun little celebratory thing, because in that case, it was very easy to replace it with just more LaCroix pretty much. Yeah. You know, I'm just having fun. Uh, Overwatch is fun. Pokemon Go is fun. Rollerblading is fun. Whatever. All the fun things I do still fun without alcohol. Super easy to do this challenge. I think if I had ever let it become a method for dealing with stress, then when all the stressors that are happening right now because of August or whatever came about, it might have been more difficult to fight against the temptation. Yeah. Though I will say, if you are already in a pattern where there's a bad behavior you use to deal with stress, then creating some sort of cold turkey challenge like what I'm doing right now might be helpful because if I drink, I have to basically put it on my Excel spreadsheet, show everyone that I failed and I have to pay you a hundred dollars. Those are the terms of my challenge money. I know you like money. I like money. You like money too. What? Oh my God. We're like the same person. Also a great movie. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I totally lost my focus because idiocracy got into my brain. But yeah, if you wanted to get out of a bad pattern like that, then creating some strict constraints in the form of a challenge and getting an accountability buddy who likes money and will keep you accountable but who doesn't like money enough to try to sabotage you yeah because i could think of a few friends who if i said hey if i drink i'll give you 100 bucks they would be waiting at home with a handle of vodka every day just being like "Eh? Eh? Eh? you want it yeah that's not a helpful friend yeah you're the kind of friend who will gladly take my money but who will also be very disappointed in me if i fail yeah i'm taking this this money i'm buying this doesn't feel good (laughs) i'm buying this uh these stupid halloween props with your money out of disappointment yeah Really, if you have to pay me, I'm probably just going to buy something you really don't approve of to punish you further. What would I not approve of? I don't know. I don't I don't know what I wouldn't we'll, approve of. We'll find out if you mess a up. A Duck Dynasty Christmas album? Why would you not approve of that? That's the best Christmas album you'll ever find. I don't know, man. I like the August Burns Red Christmas album. I don't know. That's if, you ever, <laughs> if you ever fail your challenges, I will find something. 
You'll find something. And it will be interesting. Okay. You know what? I feel like we had a conversation like this a while ago where we were thinking of the thing for each of our friends that would basically piss them off the most. Oh, yeah, because we wanted to do like a, a in inverse secret Santa kind of thing where we yeah. try to give people gifts that we know they will just be super mad about, which obviously oh, could backfire if you do it in bad humor. But we wanted to <laughs> just stuff like stuff that somebody really wouldn't like. Oh, we were going to we were going to get Quentin a bunch of pop figurines. Yeah, because he hates pop he figurines. Hates pop figurines. So and we were like, going to get Anna like a, uh, gifts, a Donald Trump poster or something. Yeah. <laughs> And then I don't think we could think of the thing that would make me mad. Oh, no. See, I think it'll be difficult, but I will find it if I, I just find to. it funny. Don't make me find it. Yeah. Like I bought I bought Quentin a bunch of minions trading cards. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. Well, those are wonderful. And now some of them are still hidden. I those think. are those are collector's items. They're really they are. Important. They're going to be worth something someday. Yeah. That little keep calm and eat a banana card holographic mint condition it is holographic in our living room it's gonna be worth something someday i won't even have to do college info geek anymore we're gonna be rich <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway so the next one is actually seven so look at all these bonuses we got coming today i read a book called the happiness equation recently as all of you probably know because two episodes ago was the happiest equation interview with neil prostricha but he has a section of the book that goes over seven activities you can do to cultivate happiness and as a result, decrease stress. So I just wanted to really quickly go through these. Some of them actually kind of go hand in hand or reiterate what we've already said. But his big seven are three walks. So that's taking three 30 minute walks a week, going outside, getting some exercise, a 20 minute replay. So that's writing about a positive experience experience you've had for 20 minutes, which basically helps you to almost relive that experience and experience the gratitude of it. Doing random acts of kindness, which really does make you feel good. Let's see here, a complete unplug. So basically having a complete unplug means having a hard stop time for your work and also turning your phone off, being present, like you said, and just basically enjoying your relaxation time to its fullest extent. Hitting flow. So again, present mindedness, doing something productive until you hit that flow state where kind of time goes away. You don't really understand how time is flowing. And uh, let's hear two minute meditations. And this was interesting. So Massachusetts General Hospital researchers had some subjects take a course on mindfulness meditation. And what they found is that at the end, the parts of the brain associated with compassion and self-awareness had actually grown and the parts associated with stress and the bad stress response had shrank. So it literally changes your brain if you really? meditate. Yeah. That's cool. And the last one is five gratitudes, which is writing down five things a week that you're grateful for. And I think these practices are just going to help you kind of cultivate a better attitude, which will help you perceive how stress affects you in a more healthy way, which is interesting to me. The next one I had, and I like this one, was unnecessary creation. This was another thing I saw mentioned in that 99U book. And I think this is just the practice of making things 100% for fun. So side projects. Oh, so unnecessary. Like this is not, I can't tie this back into my job. I can't tie this into yeah. something else. I'm just making something. So, hey, I want to, I want to make a video game or something. And this has always been hard for me because I've always been very good at finding some weaselly way for anything I do to benefit my business somehow, yeah. some way. <laughs> oh, actually, here's one that didn't really benefit my business that much. My friend Matt just released a rap album and he made a rap album in 30 days. It was literally one month, full rap album, 10 songs from scratch. And then he had two that he put in there he had already made before. And uh, he wanted a music video. So he wanted to get a bunch of people in the music video and I filmed a little segment of me lip syncing his chorus. And that was just dumb, fun creation. I'm pretty sure that's not going to benefit my life in any way other than it being hilarious. No, you're going to be famous now. Uh, that could happen. It could happen. I don't know. I did a really close-up shot with sunglasses on, so I don't even know if people are going to be able to yeah, tell Kanye who I am. Kanye is going to tweet you. Oh, look. Kanye just tweeted me right now. Yeah. Love the vid. Hashtag crushing it. Hashtag if balling. If Kanye tweets you, give me a probably call. just to say, don't use my kid's name in your stupid five questions <laughs> podcast. 
<laughs> I hope that Northwest doesn't get mad at me for yeah. talking about him. Kanye listens to the show. That would be pretty cool. Or we'd be pretty bad. I don't know. Maybe Kanye would be mad at us. I don't Hopefully know. Hopefully not. But yeah, just get involved in some unnecessary creation. If you want to make something stupid, don't worry about whether or not it will benefit your career because just making stuff without the pressure of of thinking about what people are going to think of it or how it's going to get you ahead in some way is really fun. I think. Yeah. Not everything in life needs to be productive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes I think about this and I, I get a little bit down because this was a side project at first, but then it became my career. And now I feel like every other side project would just be taking away from the time that I should be spending on my site. But reading that in the book kind of put it in perspective for me. And I shouldn't feel bad about making dumb things for fun, even if they benefit me in no way whatsoever. So the next one was to let go of perfectionism, which is a problem that I deal with a lot. And I don't know, what do you do to deal with perfectionism? I think, well, that seems, that's pretty general. Like in what? In what? In I your work. I got to get an example. In your work. So here's an example. Any video I make now, because my channel is big, because there's a big audience waiting for it, I feel like before I even start writing that this needs to be perfect, this needs to be you know worthy of my channel, quote unquote, whatever, and that can really put a damper on my creativity. Whereas wow. in the past, I used to write really stupid posts, like uh, the one that that you narrated for me about. Oh, about toaster ovens? About toaster ovens and Oh, that's a classic. That is a classic. (laughs) Like, I would never in a million years write something like that now. But back then it was hilarious. Yeah. And so stupid. But now it's like, this needs to be perfect. This has to be the perfect video on flashcards, blah, blah, blah. It just, I don't know. Yeah. So I guess I don't know that I have great things to deal with that with everything. But when it comes to producing something or turning in something, so let's say I'm sending a really stressful email to somebody and perfectionism would come in because I would want to be like, this has to be like perfectly worded. I have Mm. to figure out how to not make them mad at me. I'm quitting my job or something. And my solution to things like that, and this would work with an article or a video script or something to that effect. I like to do things where I make it too late and then it's okay. Like if I'm sending that stressful email, I'll be like, okay, this is probably done. This is probably done, but it doesn't feel done. And then I'll just be like, uh, five, four, three, two, one. And I click it. And then I go, oh, it's a, I sent it. I sent it. It's too late though. It's too late. And now it's out of my mm. control because it's too late. And because it's out of my control, I don't care. We're okay. You know, I used to really operate on deadlines, like strict deadlines. Yeah. Video will go out every Thursday kind of deadlines. And I've gotten away with, from it yeah under the guise of oh well i want to put more time into my videos and to a degree that is legitimate because it actually does take more time to do it is increasing the quality Mm -hmm. i've been going through some of my old videos because um a company wants to license some of them and that's cool so i have to re-export them make a few changes and uh, i do notice the older ones you know have less b-roll less pictures which is interesting to me because my brain goes more pictures equals better but some of those old videos have a lot of views. So maybe I could just talk in front of the camera without a ton of B-roll, but my brain doesn't think so. My brain thinks it needs to be fun and crazy animations all the time. Uh, so it really does take longer. You know, all the animations in the latest video were just insane to do. But the deadlines, I think, did help me mitigate the need to be perfect because it just had to be out. So yeah, whatever I have. So like removing a tiny piece of it from your control where you're like, Hey, Hey, there's not much I can do. I had to, I had to turn it in now. Yeah. This is pretty good for what I had to turn in now. Mm Mm-hmm. As opposed to saying, well, I could turn this in when it's done. And the thing is with something like an art, a piece of art, is it ever really done? Or do you just keep wanting to improve it forever until you finally turn it in? Fashion's never finished. Yeah. So yeah. I think a deadline is probably a good thing to do there or freak out, count down and hit the submit button and, <laughs> and then have a little bit of a, an anxiety attack for 30 seconds until you're like, well, I guess I might as well just ignore it now that it's too late. That's what happens to me every single time I email someone more famous than me. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm just completely in my own head. Am I saying too much? Do I have too many paragraphs here? Are they going to ignore it? Oh my gosh. Uh, if I use too many exclamation points, I used two exclamation points in a row here. They're going to oh, think no. I'm some weird, crazed fan and I'm just completely spastic. And um, that's not how people think. They just read an email and they don't get into your head. They just read it. Yeah. You Unless know? you're emailing maybe like a psychologist or something. Maybe they'll yeah. try to read into it. But once you've sent it, it's out of your control and you're like, well, well, I can't do anything now. You can't undo a sent message like that. Mm -hmm. And if I send more, it will make it infinitely worse. I didn't yeah. mean to use two exclamation marks. I swear I'm, I'm really, a con I'm, I'm normal. Sorry. I sent that extra message off, by the way. Uh, I'm a little nervous and you just can yeah. get worse and worse and worse. So then you you're automatically stop. crazy. You're done. <laughs> you need to just be done. Plus being a person who gets many emails, uh, I can tell you that the punctuation you use is almost never the reason I will ignore and or reply to an email. I would say, okay, the number one reason that I will ignore or reply to an email is because the content is either interesting or not. But the number two reason, and this is the sad, this is, this is kind of, okay, this is good and bad. The number two reason is, did it catch me at the right time? Because I've got emails in my inbox that have been sitting there for four months and I haven't gotten to them just because I'm not that great at email. And then uh, sometimes I will just be staring at my inbox and someone will pop a question in and it's just a little interesting. Like, you know, a question like, what kind of video gear do you use, man? And I'm like, I like video gear. And I'm just staring at my email box. I'm not currently editing a video. So there's nothing else currently occupying my time. And I get back to that person in 10 seconds. And then they think, man, you're so responsive to emails. I can't believe how easy it is to get a hold of you. If only they knew. Yeah, because if, if they had sent it like a half hour <laughs> earlier, they would never have received a response. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's so it's good and bad because, you know, the good part of it is you don't have to worry too much about the exact way you write something. Just follow some general rules. Keep it pretty much short and don't be too me, me, me focused with your emails. There are, you know, just very simple tips you can use to write better emails. But the bad side of it is if you catch me on a day where I'm already stressed out, I've got a million things going on. I might think to myself, I really wish I could answer this email, which I always think to every email, but I have to prioritize. I have to triage archiving that one. Whereas if you catch me next Monday or something and I'm in a different state of mind, I might answer. And that's just that's kind of how anybody works unless they have a strict I will answer. I won't answer policy. But I think most people it's really just how'd you catch them? Yeah. So because the world works that way, perfectionism is not useful. So just get it good. Good is enough. Perfect is the enemy of good. So get to good and then ship it, publish it, be done with it. And the last real tip I had was to take stock of your relationships. And if you find that you have toxic relationships in your life that are causing you a lot of stress, consider cutting them out. Now, obviously you cannot cut out every single relationship that causes you stress. There's family ties, all kinds of stuff. But if you got friends who constantly borrow money from you and don't pay back, or they're always really negative about what you want to do. Maybe you have dreams or projects you're working on. They always have negative things to say, or they're trying to drag you down. Don't, don't keep those relationships. It's not worth it. Yeah. You know, and, uh, I need to temper this, this tip here because I've gotten questions from people along the lines of, I like my friends, but they're not the same kind of productivity minded people that I am. They don't want to get up early. They don't want to work on personal projects. They don't want to take all the hard classes. They just kind of like to hang out. Should I get rid of those friends? You know, they've heard the, you're the product of the five people you spend the most time around advice. Yeah. I don't necessarily agree with that. And I had that mental dilemma. I've had that mental dilemma in my head since high school when I hung out with friends who really just like to play video games and chill out. And I was always a very ambitious person. Sometimes I would think, should I ditch these people and go try to make super ambitious friends? And I'm really glad that I never did because what I found is as long as you do go build relationships with the kind of people who will encourage you and who are encouraging you by proxy because they're doing things in their own lives, as long as you have those kind of people in your life and you have regular correspondence with them, 
I think that's enough. So it's not necessarily literally the five people that you spend the most time with, Mm -hmm. but like the five that you choose to take the most inspiration from. Yeah. And I think as in many different areas, I am always the moderate here. There's going to be some really gung-ho entrepreneur person out there who will probably disagree with me and who will actually believe that, no, you should cut out lazy people from your life and only spend time with super go-getter, hashtag ballin people all the time. Otherwise, you're going to fail and your blog's going to get hacked by spam bots or something. That seems unrelated, Tom. Do you want to talk about it? (laughs) (laughs) And you're just going to fade into irrelevancy, man. But I don't believe that. I think you can have friends who have very different ways of looking at the world as long as you do have people in your life who will motivate you. You don't have to spend every minute around them, but at least have them around. So cut out toxicity, but don't mistake different views on work and different levels of ambition for toxicity. You need to actually identify, you know, what about this relationship is actually toxic or am I just a little delusional right now because I've read too many motivational articles on BuzzFeed. Yeah. Well, to be honest, if you're nothing but ambitious and productive 100% of the time, I feel like that good stress you're using to motivate yourself is going to turn into distress eventually if you never relax. Oh, yeah. If you never have fun. Yeah, for sure. And uh, so we have the bonus tip, but I think you should say it because it comes from your girlfriend. Yeah, I don't know if that's a real tip. <laughs> I don't know if it's a real tip. She said to read Harry Potter. I guess that works. That's a, a pretty hashtag good tip. Ashley tip. Yeah. And hey, I think it could work. I mean, Harry I Potter is a pretty good book. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So there you go. If you're stressed out. Hey, that's externally focused. Just read man. Harry Potter, man. Or be like me and play Heli Attack 2 at miniclip.com. Yeah. That's still up. Replay old video games because new video games are bad. That is true. Well, okay. I'm going to disagree okay, with you there. all bad. Play I'm going to disagree with you because... Play the GameCube because the GameCube is good. Look, man. Overwatch and Splatoon. Yeah, I don't play multiplayer games like so that. So good. I don't do that. And Enter the Gungeon, not multiplayer. So good. So good. But I will agree with you. In most in most cases, I do love to go on my nostalgia well, trips. I like play to play the old games. games because I have no pressure to complete them. There's no stress to complete them. I'm just like, I already beat this. So I'm just messing around. I've never felt stress to complete a game ever. Even if it's new. Well, then you're a filthy casual. Am Tom. I just a filthy casual? Yep. Maybe. That's it. That's the case. It's sounding like filthy casuals have it better. <laughs> uh, maybe that's <laughs> the what truth you is think. revealed. Maybe that's what you think. Being a filthy casual, <laughs> duh. You need to be jaded and elitist about all the hardcore hobbies. gamers. Just deny that while they're crying themselves to sleep at yeah. night. If you are no, not better jaded than a filthy and casual. elitist, then what are you doing? I don't know, man. Having fun. Probably. Having fun. But you're not having fun in the right way. Yeah. <laughs> So those are the the right, methods yeah, we're we dealing we get, with. We got through all ten. Did we do bad that? stress? We did. I wanted to talk a bit about how do you you can use stress to your advantage because, yeah. like we said, with the right mindset, stress is very very useful. So I think the first thing here to do is if you consider stress to be something bad, put the bad aspects of stress into a little box in your mind and label it chronic stress with a little like sub label of bad reactions to stress, because overall in the short term, stress is good. It hones your focus. And I've always considered stress to be kind of an affirmation that you have meaning in your life, because if there's no stress, then it's 100% apathy for everything. You know, if you're not 100% apathetic, that means you care. And the things you care about, the moment anything threatens them, there's going to be some stress there. So it's an affirmation that you do care, that you are going somewhere, that there's progress, and that's good. And uh, that going back to that study I referenced earlier, the one I didn't have the link for right now, athletes think about stress in this way. They use their stress to their advantage, sometimes to a scary degree. For example, my dad has always been a power lifter as long as I can remember, and we would go to powerlifting meets when I was a kid and a teenager. And some of the guys there would have their friends slap them in the face as hard as they could before they would go do a bench lift or a squat. And some of them had little bottles of ammonia crystals that they would just like sniff real quick. And this uh, world that I have been missing out. Oh, powerlifters are. Yeah, they're pretty hardcore. So when I would compete in powerlifting competitions when I was probably 13 or 14, 
I would have my brother smack me in the face as hard as possible <laughs> before I would go lift. And I transferred that over to wrestling in high school. So when I had wrestling meets and my brother would come to watch, I would have him smack me in the face before Punch I Punch me in the face, bro. Break my nose. <laughs> I'm going to win. Yeah. So my brother would smack me in the face and then I would go win a match. I mean, I guess you're using the stress. Boom. So I was using stress to my advantage. I don't know that I would do that. For most things, <laughs> I really need to finish this paper. Kick me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, man? That could be the most effective tip yeah, ever. But if they kick you too hard, it's going to be too much stress. That's and true. It's going to become distress. Look, the brain damage, that actually doesn't help. Yeah. So that's why it has to be an open palm slap. No brain damage from that. Yeah. Unless well, it's like an open palm slap from a gorilla. Then, then it is. Uh, yeah. If you have a gorilla motivating you for things, then... <laughs> You don't need to take advice from me. Buy your, the your new life is way more interesting. <laughs> buy the new Cinco motivational gorilla. Yeah, <laughs> the newest product, guaranteed to motivate you to do something. Yeah, maybe it's run, but maybe it's make all your dreams come true. Maybe it's one or the other. We have a fifty percent guarantee that it's make all your dreams come true. Yeah, but no refunds. <laughs> well. Anyway, yeah, the point is that like stress can be used usefully, and this is what procrastinators do all the time, accidentally. Because they yes. wait until the last minute and then they let that, that burst of stress that's like, you have like 40 pages to write in two days. And then they let that stress fuel them through the work. See, I, I can never come to terms with whether or not that's a legitimate strategy or if it's just an excuse. Well, I think that I don't think most people are doing it on purpose as a strategy. I think it's accidental. Yeah. Well, Gretchen Rubin in her book, Better Than Before, she kind of outlined different personality types and she she outlined the difference between marathoners and sprinters and she kind of gave a label to people who kind of do get motivation by the deadline coming up and looming. And I have to wonder, you know, I've spent so many years saying that's not really a good way to do your work. You should be more disciplined and planned. But honestly, I think the deadline really does hone your focus. There is some stress there and it might be useful. Yeah. Well, I won't say that I've done this on purpose to cleverly take advantage of that stress, but I certainly did very well on a lot of things that I procrastinated on mm -hmm. all the time throughout my entire life. Yeah. So related to stress being good and reframing your mindset to think about it in that way, just your attitude in general is going to affect how you live your life and how happy you are and how stressed out you are a huge amount. Going back to the happiness equation, Neil actually outlined some research in his book that points to your attitude defining 90% of your happiness and your circumstances defining just 10% of it. So I wanted to quote this preacher that he quoted in the book. His name is Charles Swindle, and he had this quote about your attitude. And he said, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past the education, the money, and circumstances, and failure, and successes, than what other people think or say or do. It's more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It'll make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude that we embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are all in charge of our attitudes. I really liked that quote a lot. And it just reminded me to think about how I react to the things that come into my life, how I set my attitude every single day. So that's kind of how I wanted to close up this podcast. Martin's laptop died. It was so, an accident. <laughs> um, Oh, wait, you know what? You can still talk, though, because yeah, I can my talk. computer is running your good. mic. We're still okay, good. cool. I saw you put the laptop away, and I was like, oh, no, he can't talk anymore. I just uh, have to smoothly close the episode out. No. But no, it's running off my mic. Cool. I mean, this about wraps it up anyway. The only thing else that I want to I say is that in regards to the attitude thing, a lot of stresses, you can view stress as either a challenge to overcome or as a threat to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the challenge is better. And if you have a lot of stress, like your life is hard, you've got an injury or you grew up with money problems or you've got any number of things. If you view these things as sort of a super dope background, 
like a backstory for when you're successful later and you'll be like, yeah, well, I made it through the struggle and now I'm successful. That's like a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's if you view it as a challenge to work through and be proud of working through, then it will be a lot better than if you view it as I'm a victim of the universe and this isn't fair. Yeah, there's actually a, a concept called locus of control and there's the internal locus of control, which is basically like you said, you make things happen and the external locus of control, which is that things happen to you. And to kind of build on what you said a little bit here, when you adopt the internal locus of control, I think you view things that happened to you in the past, like you said, as struggles that you overcame and viewing your past struggles like that as challenges, I think really helps you put the future challenges you have coming into perspective because now they're no longer, oh, more things happening to me. I dealt with all that crap in the past. All that stuff happened to me. It was bad. And here come more. It's no, it's more challenges. And I have already demonstrated that I have the ability to overcome challenges. So bring them on. To end here, one final note for using stress to your advantage. I think stress can be a reminder to keep your social life in check. If you have been working too much, if you have a ridiculous schedule and you're overly stressed, let it be a reminder to you that maybe I should spend more time with my friends or my family. Maybe I need to call my mom because social relationships and social interactions, we kind of feed on them. We're, we're social creatures. And if you're not letting those things have their, you know, be a part of your life, then you're going to be stressed. So kind of work backwards. Use that stress as a reminder to keep your social life in check. So that's all we got for this episode. Ended up being a lot longer than I planned, but I think it was good. And hopefully you guys enjoyed it as well. If you want to find the show notes for this episode, you can go over to cigpodcast.com. And there you'll find the entire page for the podcast with every episode listed. You can find the show notes for this particular episode over at the episode 119 link. You'll find lots of studies we referenced, books we referenced. And you'll also find ways to rate and review the podcast on iTunes, which really helps the show grow and get out to more people and also tells us how we're doing. So if you want to support the show, you can do that. It takes about five minutes. Otherwise, thanks so much for listening and we'll see you in the next episode. Stay cute.